I'm sitting in Nairobi with Esmond Martin, a wildlife trade expert with particular interest and expertise on rhino horn trade and ivory trade. Esmond, welcome. Thank you, Paula. Esmond, you recently published an article that is just hitting all the newspapers around the world. Can you tell me a little bit about this? Yes, my wife and I, Chrissy, we did some work last year in Russia on the mammoth ivory trade, and it's absolutely booming. It came about with the International Ban on Elephant Ivory Trade, which was in 1990 that came through CITES. And then the traders and the consumers, the craftsmen, uh, were looking for substitute materials. And they looked at hippo teeth, they looked at warthog tusks, etc. And they didn't like what they were seeing. So they uh, decided to purchase uh, mammoth ivory. So mammoth ivory is now uh, one of the major substitute materials for elephant ivory. Where on earth are they getting all this ivory from? Most mammoths have been extinct for about 9,500 years. But incredibly, there was a small population on Rangley Island, which is northeast of Siberia, and is one of the most inhospitable places in the world. And presumably, that's why these mammoths existed. And they were about two or 3,000 years ago. It's absolutely incredible. And what's been happening is that the price of mammoth ivory has gone up very considerably. It's now selling in uh, Hong Kong for about $350 a kilo wholesale. And so during June through September each year, the tundra there starts to melt. And the people there sort of stop what they're doing, and they start wandering around looking for these mammoth tusks in the tundra. Many of them are on river banks and lakes and that type of thing. And they collect them, and they bring them to Moscow. And there's one major trader there who exports most of them to Hong Kong. It's an animal that's very similar to an elephant, but it isn't exactly an elephant. Is it really indistinguishable? No, it's not indistinguishable. You can distinguish it uh, by the marks. Also, as you can imagine, with mammoth ivory, it's been in the tundra for thousands of years. So there's a lot of cracks in it and a lot of waste material. Maybe up to two-thirds of it is waste. It's also harder than elephant ivory, as you can imagine. So it's not as good as elephant ivory. But since elephant ivory is banned in most international trade, this is a substitute. So when the mammoth ivory is exported to Hong Kong, it's then re-exported to southern China, where labor is much cheaper than Hong Kong. It's like one-tenth the price. And there it's uh, carved into all kinds of items, jewelry, statues, etc., etc. And then much of that goes back to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong's the main retail market area in the world for mammoths. There are thousands and thousands of pieces for sale. How much mammoth ivory is there out there? Can it really replace that volume of trade? Nobody knows how many mammoths are dead out there, but there must be in the tens of thousands, absolutely minimum. Recently, between about 40 and 60 tons of mammoth ivory have been exported from Russia, so that, that's quite a bit. There are conservationists who are quite alarmed by this, that mammoth ivory will replace the elephant ivory in terms of the production of these artifacts and jewelry, and they're saying that it's actually going to stimulate the ivory trade at a time when the world is trying to say elephant ivory and elephant ivory products are unethical. There could be a problem of mixing the elephant ivory and mammoth ivory pieces. In other words, one could uh, export elephant ivory and claim that those pieces are mammoth ivory. The big problem isn't the substitute per se, I think. The problem would be if there was a huge price differential, and then people would try to uh, hoodwink the customs authorities and move large quantities of elephant ivory and claiming it was mammoth ivory. But there's hardly any incident of that. Elephant killing and poaching and illegal trade in ivory is still rampant across Africa. In fact, there was just a seizure yesterday here in Kenya, and there have been almost every week a seizure somewhere around Asia or in Africa. What, what do you think is going on? Why is the trade still so enormous, given that there is this international ban? There's an international ban on trade, but there's still a demand for ivory. China is the main problem. They're the biggest importer of illegal ivory in the world, and most of that is coming from Central Africa. And the other main consuming country is Thailand, and they're importing a, a lot of illegal ivory as well for their local uh, carving industry. Bangkok's absolutely full of ivory. The Central African population of elephants is declining very sharply. There may be under 20,000 of them left. But in Southern Africa, the population of elephants is actually increasing. So if you look at the whole situation in Africa, the population of elephants at the moment is probably stable. But there's no doubt that there's very heavy poaching of elephants in certain countries. There have been photographs in some of the media showing Michelle Obama wearing a necklace that some journalists think is actually mammoth ivory. How would anyone know and what would you do to determine if that was mammoth ivory or real ivory? I've seen these photographs in the Sunday Times and in The Guardian, but uh, 
I don't know whether it's mammoth ivory or not. How can you tell? I mean, one easy way is just ask Michelle Obama what the substance is or where it came from. <laughs> what if she's been hoodwinked herself? Well, there's nothing wrong with mammoth ivory. I mean, there's only one country in the world that's got restrictions on it, as far as I know, and that's India. So it's legal absolutely everywhere. So there's no problem at all, as far as I can see, here using mammoth ivory. International bans, substitute materials, they don't seem to be working. Elephants are still dying. What do you think? What can we actually do to stop the poaching of elephants and actually conserve these incredible animals? You'll never eliminate poaching entirely. I mean, elephant ivory has been part of almost every major culture in the world, in Asia, in the New World, uh, Africa, and other places. You'll never eliminate entirely. It's like trying to get rid of prostitution or trying to get rid of the drug trade. You won't do it. What we would like to do is get the consumers to use substitute materials that are acceptable in their culture or get out of it entirely. Don't buy illegal ivory. But then there's an added problem of these one-off sales, which has, there have been two of them now. The first one went all to Japan, and the second one went to China and to Japan. So that also confuses things a, a bit. I mean, there are two ways of looking at an endangered animal that has, you know, economic value. One is to increase the protection in the wild. <clears throat> and how do you do that? You need to have a certain number of people to protect the animal on the ground, Maybe in Africa you need one per 50 square kilometers. That's very, very important, and you have to have these ranges well motivated. And we also need to improve our intelligence gathering. Intelligence gathering is the most cost-effective way of saving these animals. It's absolutely hopeless if you have no information. Buying information, organizing informers is the most efficient way, and that's what we need to do. And then you need customs and people who are honest in the government system. The second thing, if there's a demand for any of their commodities, is to try to reduce the demand. Now, how do you do that? The easiest way is not to say it doesn't work, but to get a substitute material, as we've done with rhino horn, or tell the people, just don't buy it. We need to explain to the people, especially in Asia, but other places as well, that they should be using substitute materials for some of these endangered wildlife products and for medicine doctors and for traditional chemists in, in these medicine shops not to uh, prescribe these uh, rare animal products. Esmond, you're one of the world's authorities on ivory trade and rhino horn trade, and your work is unique. Nobody else is doing the kind of things you're doing. I want you to tell me a little bit about when you go off into countries like Egypt or China to do your surveys on trade in these items, how do you do it? Each country is different that I work in and try to get the uh, information. I mean, some countries I've been to so many times, like Yemen, 14 times have been there to try to encourage the government first to join CITES, bring in legislation. Then you can work openly with the government people and with the traders. I mean, I know who the traders are. I've had discussions with them. But then as the law gets tighter and tighter, as it has in Yemen, then it gets much, much more difficult. So you then have to almost entirely delegate to Yemenis to do the work which you then supervise. So it differs from country to country. Do you ever have to uh, go incognito, wear a wig and put on glasses or take a hidden camera or something like that? I work for an international television organization, and I was given a black wig for Yemen. So that was the only time that I've actually done that. But there are major problems that I face and with certain countries. And if I name the countries, I think I'd be in difficulties. But there are certain countries in the world that don't like me at all because I've eliminated the use and the demand, for instance, of rhino horn in certain Asian countries. So obviously the people that have been involved in trading that, and especially the medicine dealers, are not too happy with my presence in their country. As a conservationist, some of us think of those people as demons and really evil people who are basically driving the extinction of very rare and special African and Asian species. But what kind of people are they really? The people you deal with, the ones who are actually trading, carving, selling these products? Most of these people that you deal with have been in the business for many, many years. The difficulty is if they're only solely in the business. Now, let me give you an example with the rhino horn trade. Most of the people that are involved in selling it are also selling all these other uh, commodities. So if you get them to stop using and prescribing rhino horn, you're not putting them out of business because they're, they're selling hundreds of other items. But then if they're in it full time, then you've got a problem. But what we are doing is trying to encourage them to move into other substances. But in a place like Hong Kong, which used to be the center of the ivory trade and, and had hundreds and hundreds of carvers in the 70s, those people have not been able to use substitute materials, and they've lost their jobs, and they're taxi drivers now, construction workers, and that type of thing.
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's a kind of devastating a culture and a tradition. And some of these families, I imagine, are generations of um, carvers. Do you, do you ever meet people who have been doing it? They're like third, fourth generation ivory carvers? Yes, I have. I mean, I've just been in France just a few weeks ago. And uh, uh, up in Dieppe, there are a couple of families there that have been doing it for some period of time. And the Japanese have been it in for uh, a long period of time as well. But what I'm especially against is the poaching and the illegal trade. I mean, even in the United States and Britain and France, the ivory trade is legal within the country. I mean, I've just been in France in Paris. I, I went to one main antique area and I found over 600 pieces of ivory. So we got to make the distinction between illegal trade and legal. And as I say, almost every country in the world allows domestic trade in ivory. Not here in East Africa, surprisingly, but almost every Western European country allow a sale of ivory within the country, I mean, especially antiques. Do you think that the presence of Chinese people across Africa in very rural and remote areas is actually threatening the elephants and rhinos? The Chinese, as far as I'm aware, are not involved in illegally killing elephants or rhinos. But the Chinese are definitely involved in buying the rhino horn and the elephant ivory in Africa. About five years ago, as I remember when I was in the Sudan, uh, and in Khartoum, 75% of the ivory that I saw in Khartoum and Umdaman was being bought uh, by Chinese. And in southern Africa, Vietnamese and Chinese are being arrested. A few Chinese were just arrested in southern Africa just a few days ago, handing elephant ivory. And, and the main market now for rhino horn is China and in Vietnam. And the main market for elephant ivory is China and Thailand. Thank you for that, Esmond. This is Paula Kahumbu reporting for Wildlife Direct. If you'd like to know more about this story, please check out our website, wildlifedirect.org.